Welcome to Washington Unplugged. I'm John Dickerson. President Obama has announced his new Afghanistan strategy, and today the two men who've got to make something of it are appearing before Congress. And while General Stanley McChrystal and Ambassador Carl Eikenberry are testifying in Washington, Defense Secretary Robert Gates has gone to Afghanistan. To explain the comings and goings, we're joined by David Martin, our national security correspondent who's at the Pentagon. David, I want to start with something General McChrystal said. He, he said that he, the U.S. will reverse the Taliban insurgency within a year. Is that possible? Well, you sort of have to take his word for it. He's, he's on the, uh, the ground, and uh, he's about to get 30,000 uh, more troops. And I certainly think that that uh, infusion of uh, troops will allow them to reverse the momentum of the Taliban in parts of the country, at least. Uh, particularly uh, Helmand province. That's where uh, the uh, first troops are going to go, 9,000 Marines, uh, the first of them going to uh, start arriving there as early as next week. Uh, so um, that's going to be roughly doubling the size of the uh, Marine force fighting in Helmand province. And uh, that is going to take away uh, some of the initiative from the Taliban. The question is, uh, not can you go in and stomp the Taliban. Right. The, the question is, can you go in and convince the local population that the Taliban is going to stay stomped after you leave? Uh, and when you, uh, as an Afghan citizen, are once again r responsible for your security or have to uh, rely on the Afghan army and the Afghan police for your security, can they protect the Afghan people from the Taliban. That's the big uh, unanswered question in this, not uh, the capability of 30,000 more troops to, uh, to do uh, serious damage to the Taliban. And that was the central thesis of McChrystal's report, and, and it was the idea that killing the Taliban is almost the least important thing. So now that the president's made his decision and, and focusing on that point you just made, with Mc, which McChrystal has spent a lot of time thinking about it, mm -hmm. does the number of troops that he got uh, allow him to, to do that second important part that you talk about? Well, the number of troops that he is going to get is almost exactly what he requested. He requested 40,000 troops. The president has authorized 30,000 troops, but he has a 10 percent uh, wiggle room there. So he can actually get as many as 33,000 troops. NATO has pledged 7,000 troops. If NATO comes through on those 7,000 troops, there you are, 40,000. So he uh, is going to get almost everything he wanted, and he's going to get it faster than he originally thought he could get it. So you, you sort of have to rely on, on his ability to do the, uh, the, the fine uh, work here to uh, uh, know exactly how many troops he has to put into Coast Province and how many troops he has to put into Helmand Province uh, in order to make a difference. And uh, that was the, uh, the work that produced that 40,000 number, and he's going to get awfully close to that 40,000 number. David, one of the things he's being pressed on here in Washington in his visit is the question of this deadline. There's been a lot of talk about that in the week since the president announced his decision. Yeah. Senator Arms, Senate Armed Services Chairman Carl Levin said the president's decision is already being softened and made mush of, mush of by the Pentagon. What's your sense of, he was referring to that deadline, what's your sense of that deadline and what it means now that we've, we've known about it for a week? Well, I didn't think uh, McChrystal in his testimony this morning uh, mushed it up. He, he said, uh, I view that date as locked in. Uh, those were his words. And, and uh, he said he uh, is, is confident that he can start pulling out some combat troops in uh, the summer of 2011. I think the real question that nobody can answer right now, is it going to be a token withdrawal in order to say that you met the deadline? or is it going to be the start of a real withdrawal such as is happening in Iraq? What's the purpose of Secretary Gates's trip? Well, uh, it's, it's sort of a standard procedure after you have a major uh, uh, presidential decision like this for the Secretary of Defense to go to the theater of, of war. He, went, he did the same thing 
uh, after the surge was announced in, uh, in Iraq and explain it to the troops, uh, explain it to the leadership of the, uh, of the Afghan government and put pressure on the Afghan government that it's got uh, its side of the deal that it has to hold up, which is uh, to provide uh, better government for the people of Afghanistan and to uh, provide a less corrupt police force and a larger army. And all those things are uh, factors that are really as much under uh, Karzai's control as they are under uh, McChrystal's. I want to ask you one quick question at the end mm -hmm. here, David. Is this report about National Security Advisor Jim Jones going to the Pakistanis and saying, basically, you take on the Taliban or we will? What do you make of that? Well, I, it, I think it was a, uh, a very unmistakable threat. Uh, um, I think uh, he, he basically used the terms, uh, uh, we will use all the means at our disposal if you can't do it. So uh, what he's saying is, is that, look, uh, the, the Taliban that, is, uh, uh, that we are fighting in Afghanistan, the Taliban that is killing American soldiers in Afghanistan, is located in uh, the city of Quetta in western Afghanistan and uh, nobody goes after them. The Pakistani army doesn't go after them and so far the drone strikes which the, uh, uh, the United States conducts have stayed well away from, from western uh, Pakistan and, and basically he was telling the Pakistani, Pakistani government if you don't start putting pressure on this uh, the leadership of the a Afghan Taliban that is headquartered in western Pakistan, then we're going to do it. Okay, David Martin at the Pentagon. Thanks very much, David. Sure. Now to Massachusetts. It's primary day and the race to fill the spot once held by the late Senator Edward Kennedy. Joining me from Boston is John Keller, political analyst for CBS affiliate WPBZ TV. John, welcome. What can you tell me about turnout? Uh, are people rushing to the polls? What's happening? Well, normally, uh, primary election or election day in Massachusetts is kind of a festive affair. This is a very politically charged and active place. Not today. It's a sunny, cold day across Massachusetts. Early anecdotal reports are a very low voter turnout. This is a race that has failed to grip the imagination of the electorate in fairly spectacular fashion, if that's not an oxymoron, John. Why, John, is that the case? It's a snoozer, but this is the first open seat in Massachusetts in 25 years. Ted Kennedy had that seat for 47 years. Shouldn't people have been chomping at the bit? Why has it been such a kind of lazy affair? There's a number of different reasons. One is I think people are somewhat in shock. Uh, losing Ted Kennedy, I, I don't even know if people around the country understand exactly what he means here in Massachusetts. It's believed in some quarters that Ted Kennedy was personally responsible for anywhere from 20 to 30 percent of, of the economy in Massachusetts in terms of maintaining the flow of federal funds to our, our research uh, establishment, our teaching hospitals and so forth. Also the timing of the special. We've never had a statewide special election and coming in the sort of the start of the holiday season, it's awkward, it's unusual. I think that's added to the, the situation. Thirdly, it's been an uninspiring campaign. Uh, none of the candidates in either party have really lit up the night sky, to say the least. Their ads have been terrible. The debates have been like watching snow melt. So that's been a problem. And finally, in the Democratic primary, which is really where all the most of the juice and the action is, uh, the four candidates, somewhat inexplicably in my view, have run to the far left of the political spectrum here. Uh, yes, Massachusetts is a very liberal state, but you're really talking about 20 to 30 percent of the Democratic electorate that is, for instance, to the left of President Obama on Afghanistan, the way the four Democratic candidates are, to the left of Obama on the death penalty, the way the four Democrats are. So if you're a moderate or, heaven forbid, even a conservative Democrat in Massachusetts or independent voter, you're feeling left out by the whole thing. They're not even talking to you, John. And there's not really even a Kennedy candidate, is there? There's not one that's been kind of supported by the family. No, Max Kennedy, one of the sons of the late Robert F. Kennedy, uh, has endorsed Alan Casey, the co-founder of City Year and uh, sort of a long shot outsider candidate in the Democratic primary. Caroline Kennedy, daughter of JFK, showed up at a fundraiser for Casey but didn't issue a public endorsement. That's been it. 
Joe Kennedy, the former congressman who uh, was talked of as a major potential candidate in this race but declined to get in, he has conspicuously stayed silent, and Ted's widow, Vicki Kennedy, has not endorsed either. So uh, the, the family has stayed out of it, and that could have been a major factor here. Going into today, it looked like the Attorney General, uh, Martha Coakley, was the front runner. Is that the way you see it? Yes, for a number of different reasons. First of all, in kind of an interesting twist, the, uh, I guess women are supposed to, at least in the political realm, have somewhat better manners. But in this case, the only female candidate was getting this Senate race together uh, really for a number of years, and certainly she started on it aggressively as soon as the word got out that Ted Kennedy was suffering from a fatal illness. A number of other male candidates have uh, and male political figures have tried to criticize her for that, that it was unseemly for her to get out there, and everyone has kind of laughed that off. Anybody who knows Ted Kennedy knows that if the situations had been reversed, he would have been working the phones immediately upon hearing that there might be an opening coming up. So she's run hard and aggressively. She's well organized. She's the only woman in a, in a race against three men. And Massachusetts has a terrible record of electing women uh, to political office, uh, certainly to federal office. Yep. Uh, there's never been a female senator, and so I think that's worked in her favor, too. And very quickly here at the end, John, uh, there will be a Republican in this race. Uh, but is it just a formality in January, or, or is there any chance for the Republican? Yes, there's a chance. Uh, I mentioned uh, the other day when we were talking, if the Red Sox could win the World Series twice in my lifetime, anything can happen. And uh, Scott Brown, who's considered the front runner in the Republican primary, it fits the template of a Republican who can win in this, the bluest state. Uh, uh, moderate on social issues, fiscally conservative. The question is, will he have ample funds to even compete? We'll find out soon enough. Okay, John Keller, thanks very much. We'll look forward to talking to you uh, in January when that election rolls around. Thank, Thank you all you. for watching Washington Unplugged. Join us here every day at cbsnews.com at 12.30 p.m. I'm John Dickerson. Have a great day.